So, we're Film at Wonder, and we're here with Yuji Develp. Yuji, thank you very much for being with us. Thank you for inviting me, Taz. And, well, why don't you tell us a bit about yourself? So, yeah, so I'm Yuji Develp. Um, I'm half French, half Japanese, uh, studying management at LSE, but I also have a diploma in war studies at King's. Um, right now, I'm really interested in information warfare, specifically fake news and propaganda. Uh, so, I've launched a tech publication called Wonkbridge and it's a publication where we get student insights on issues like fake news for instance. So what is fake news? So fake news has been sort of the poster child of the last couple of years in terms of all these disasters at least in terms of um, liberal students have pointed this out as a disaster uh, in the freedom on the internet. Everyone thought that the internet was going to be a boon for freedom and democracy around the world, a source of information for people who didn't have access to it in the past. And fake news has sort of been the, um, the antithesis to this, right? Because we blamed the outcome of Donald Trump's election on fake news, at least the Democrats have. Okay, so why is that? Well, it's an easy po sock puppet, I guess. It's an easy um, excuse in terms of we in the West don't have much control over uh, what content goes viral or not. You know, we just click on articles that seem interesting to us. Mm -hmm. And fake news just happens to be targeted in, you know, these clickbait titles and um, these ridiculous statements. We're just curious to click that button and maybe share to our friends. So it's sort of, we have no control over how fake news develops. Well, I suppose we have no control over how it develops, but you know, it seems to me that the lines between real and fake news become increasingly blurred. How do we discern between one and the other? And so, I mean, last Saturday we were at a hackathon and trying to figure out um, solutions to fake news, right? And already, solution to fake news would be um, a euphemism. It's, it's not something we can solve in a day, nor something we should solve, might I, uh, might I state because it's so hard to discern between fake news and people just wanting to express themselves. Um, fake news could also be satire. It could also be someone just trying to provoke his Facebook friends list, you know? Uh, and so drawing the line between that and um, any type of expression is difficult. Um, but people have tried to do that in the past, uh, in the last few years, actually. Um, for example, CNN, uh, Le Monde, um, Politico, they have all launched their own fact-checking agencies and these fact-checking agencies basically look at all the major issues that are out there and sort of discern whether or not something is a fact or not. Uh, they're using their big editorial team to uh, spend lots of time on deciding whether something uh, is backed by evidence or not. Um, of course, the issue with that is that it's a painstakingly slow process and often you're responding to events and fake news rather than preempting them. Okay. Another, um, another style of looking at it is saying, okay, here's a list of publishers uh, that are recognized and verified by um, some independent body, right? And so that's something the German government is working on right now, and uh, also the Filipino government. So as you can see, um, any government could really start listing accepted news agencies, and anything produced by those agencies would be considered as news and therefore anything false would be fake news. But it's right. censorship, isn't it, at the end of the day? Why don't you tell us a little bit more about Hackathon, what you did and you know how it went for you? So the great thing about that Hackathon, um, organized by Future Foreign Policy, was that we'd come in with ideas as a team of five people. Um, it was made up of a team of Wonkbridge people as well. Um, and we'd be challenged by experts that are actually working in the field. Uh, so we'd had a developer that's working at Newspeak House, which is like a political technology incubator here in London. And she was developing an app, actually an algorithm to triage between fake news and real news and to um, appraise the quality of news. That's something we originally wanted to do. We wanted to find a list of parameters that we think are needed to be fulfilled in order for something to be quality news. Mm -hmm. And after that, we'd be able to grade every publishing house on the scale of whether or not they fulfill these parameters. The issue with that is that technologically, uh, the developer said, this is, we don't have the technology out there yet. Um, no matter how much machine learning or big data you have, 
there will be glaring issues and glaring um, exceptions uh, that, 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 make, that, that make a technological solution just seem like the wrong decision to make. And also it's rather undemocratic and unethical as well. Um, we also had a policymaker from Westminster come in and talk about these issues. And it's just something that in the UK at least, in the UK in the current political environment, you can't come in and say we are going to decide what information is more correct right. uh, than the other. It's just too 19, 1984-esque, you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, so we ended up evolving the discussion into what actually would solve the issue of echo chambers, which is the cause of fake news, right? Okay. Fake news has a hold in people's minds and spirits because people believe in certain values and certain uh, political ideals. And so that's why we should look at what, what you know, uh, at echo chambers. Um, and the best way we found to deal with echo chambers is actually just to have contact with different people and different opinions. That's why um, university is actually a great way to pull down echo chambers. Uh, that being said, university itself is an echo chamber. Right. Um, so we have to find a way to pull down echo chambers without becoming an echo chamber by itself. Right. What we ended up finding was to create, to use the technology we have on smart grids and um, mapping technology to basically find where people um, from different echo chambers uh, are residing uh, using government data and Google data, for instance, and then be able to propose to them a service, you know, maybe for in exchange for a tax break or some other type of incentive, they would be able to participate in this massive domestic Erasmus program where you would be able to have a five minute talk or maybe a five day workshop with other people from completely different echo chambers than you. Uh, and it, it, it's very um, similar to the interfaith dialogue uh, type of style um, where you can start understanding where people come from in their opinions. And that's sort of the first step in terms of reconciling uh, different opinions. Is technology partly responsible for the spreading of fake news? So technology has proved an accelerator. Um, in the last 25 years, most technologies, and still going on, right, are accelerators of processes that exist in the real world. You know, the internet is an accelerator of information. Machine learning is an accelerator of analysis. And in that point of view, news and social media has been a major accelerator in not only good quality news, you know, we've never had so many reports, so many uh, studies made by universities and academics ever, mm -hmm. but it's also an accelerator for lower tier uh, news, you know. Um, so gutter press, yellow press, press basically whose sole objective is to get views and shares um, and they're doing very well on social media because social media is built on foundations of shares. Um, on a side note, Facebook's whole business model for instance is based on ad revenues yeah. and ad revenues, are their KPIs are still based on this archaic television form of KPIs which is, you know, how much view time, how much share time, how, much, how many times do people refer to this ad when they buy a product. So it's, it's all based on virality and uh, uptime. And so that's the issue with technology is that it's accelerated this lower tier um, information and we have to find a way to regulate this new space called the internet mm -hmm. in a way that's ethical and technologically possible. So Wonkbridge. You talked about Wonkbridge, you're the co-founder and you're a small team. Yep. What exactly do you do? So Wonkbridge is a technology publication slash think tank. Uh, we saw a space in that there are no publications out there for students who deal with technology. There are no technology publications out there who deal solely with the content of students. And so we saw perhaps this is a huge glaring uh, mistake in that you're talking about the future generations and future generations don't have an opportunity to participate. And so this was um, in, in met instant success. We are publishing something every week. Um, we have a very small team of five people, but every meeting is super dynamic, dynamic and definitely something I enjoy doing in university. But the whole concept of Wonkbridge is to focus on so, a couple projects. So we look at echo chambers. It's called project breaking out of the echo chamber. 
And another project we're looking at is state uses of cyber, uh, cyber tools, so cyber warfare. Um, and so what we do is we interview experts, professionals in the field, and then give a chance for students to provide analysis. All of this into a cohesive project. And what we're planning to do at the end of this year is to publish our first report, a Wonkbridge report, that we can hopefully get um, it reviewed and actually out there as a public, uh, as a study that's recognized. Yeah. So what can we do? Distance yourself from Wonkbridge for a second. Say you are a non-techie person. Right. How can we help and, you know, to regulate the industry and make sure that fake, fake news isn't spreading? Well, I'm not techie. I don't know how to code. I've tried Python, but um, as my friend uh, Nico, who's also in Wonkbridge, would testify, um, for someone that isn't familiar with, with code or with the whole you know, STEM subjects, it's, it's much more useful to be involved in technology, but think about the larger issues in terms of why should we use technology? Uh, how do we use it? And um, to what extent can we use it ethically? Yeah. And these are questions that are going to become more and more important. So it is important to invest yourself early on. Um, at university, it's perfect because you have such a huge network of people to instantly have, you know, instantly have these conversations with. Uh, and so what, you know, what me, Nico, and a few others from Wonkbridge did, um, including Max, for instance, we just organized sort of a discussion group er early on and then said, why don't we just create a platform for other people to join a discussion group and actually produce recommendations for it. Um, and I think if you look at the literature out there on the internet, for instance, in cybersecurity, it's mostly just technical people discussing technical solutions to what they see as a solely technical issue, cybersecurity. But as you saw with Russian, uh, Russian hacks, you know, the US hacking on Russia as well, it's, it's all over the place. Uh, it's become very much a political security issue as well. So why don't we have people who study security to talk about it? And why don't we have people who represent civil society to talk about you know, the effects of it on their daily lives? And perhaps you know, people from other uh, domains having similar issues and how have, how have they tackled this problem? Um, and so we truly believe that you know, if we include as many people in the discussion process, maybe we'll come out with a solution that's less um, echo chambery than, uh, than than otherwise yeah so you've mentioned Trump and how fake news affected the US election do you think that fake news affected Brexit interesting you say that because people usually say that fake news is a global phenomenon and it truly is um, but its applications and the people who employ it are different in every country and in Brexit for instance fake news was less blamed for the outcome of the gen general referendum uh, mainly because the UK has a already very strong institution of, let's just say, media from every tier of quality uh, in the country. And so fake news was just not that much of a different uh, sort of news than what the UK population is used to already. It's sort of a black horse for UK policymakers in that the Brexit example is a big um, exception to fake news um, in that... UK population is used to fake news, but hasn't yet completely digested um, the fake news issue. They still fall for the same tricks. And so perhaps fake news is playing on tricks that people can't really get used to. Mm -hmm. um, so sort of hooks and uh, when, when, when a fake news article says that, you know, for example, at McDonald's, um, human meat is being put into the patties, that is instantly going to be an object of interest, no matter what you people say about fake news or how people educate you. Um, so that's a little bit of an issue. And as we saw in the U US, it was fake news helped the right wing win. Mm -hmm. And in the UK, it's very much a shared situation. Um, you have you know, Breitbart um, and other like media feeding into the right, but there is also fake news in the left, right? Um, there is the Canary, for instance, um, which is a very, um, ha often publishes fake news uh, okay. in the UK. We've talked about Wonkbridge and where you are currently at the moment. You've got two projects. Where do you see Wonkbridge in the future? Will you be taking on more projects? Will your model as a startup change or? So um, we will stay with our model of pursuing just a few projects every year. 
Um, we will do a yearly cycle so that we can fit in the same timeline as the university cycle, mm -hmm. right? Um, so we'll be publishing reports based off of uh, analysis and competitions that we participate in. So this year we focused on echo chambers and on uh, cyber warfare. Uh, next year we're thinking perhaps to look into artificial intelligence mm -hmm. and to be looking into uh, the future of marketing, for instance. Um, I've been reading articles about in maybe 30 years or 25 years, we'd be able to send ads into your dreams. And so you'd probably have to pay a fee to be ad free in your dreams uh, if you want to preserve your independence. So that's, that's where scary. Ah, it's terrifying. It's terrifying. Um, but at the same time, imagine you've got 100% attention in your dreams. It's in terms of KPIs, the most profitable investment you could make as a marketer. Uh, and so these are the kinds of questions we could tackle now in order to have a better debate about it later when they actually come up. Wonkbridge is a successful startup company. You've essentially you know, built a small team of very competitive people who are, you know, understand the technology industry that you're currently going into. Um, you see so many young people out there today with great ideas, but nowhere to channel those ideas through. Um, so what advice do you have to, you know, young independent entrepreneurs who are trying to make their break? Well, I don't think it's um, a startup in the strict sense. I mean, we are just uh, trying to provide service for people that, um, wants to get their voices heard uh, and I don't really think I'm in a position um, to give advice but everyone's advice is valuable for sure um, I'd say get involved because people want to hear what you have to say um, often as university students we underestimate the insight we have and um, the value people hold to that insight in the professional world or even in your family world or social world, whatever um, the case is. And so my one advice would be create this infrastructure in which you can get your voice heard as much as possible. Create a megaphone uh, in a way. Um, you've created it with Fluent Wonder. Uh, I've tried, probably will improve on creating it at Wonkbridge. Uh, just create a platform for your, yourself to express yourself. It may seem narcissistic at first, of course, but people want you to go and tell people uh, how, what your opinion is on these issues because at the end of the day, you're helping out in the debate that's ongoing uh, and the debates that are going right now are some of the most consequential um, in history. Thank you very much, Yuji. We uh, hope to interview you again in the future someday and we wish you all the best with your endeavors and with Longbridge, the hackathon. Thank you. Thank you, Taz. Always a pleasure.